Welcome to the second museum conversation of the new academic year. My name is Ivan Gaskell, and I'm on the faculty of Bard Graduate Center. And I want to begin by acknowledging that Bard Graduate Center is on the island of Manahata within the ancestral lands of the Lene Lenape people. It's long been a gathering site for native peoples from many places. All those who claim title to real property here do no more than hold that property in trust for the native person who, in Henry David Thoreau's account, will one day knock on the door of the White House and incontrovertibly demand its return. For me, it's a particular pleasure to welcome this evening's speaker, Anne-Sophie Lehmann. However, that pleasure is tempered with disappointment. Disappointment that we have been unable to bring her here for a week-long residency in person owing to COVID-19 travel restrictions. These mean that Professor Lehmann is speaking to us from her home in the beautiful old city of Groningen in the Netherlands. On the other hand, perhaps I'm having a lucky escape because Anne-Sophie is a night owl, her own self-description, which means that she's been here, had she been here in person, I could have expected some drink-fueled conversation into the small hours. During a visit to Groningen, she had me and our companions up until later at night than I've been awake since I was an undergraduate. It was quite wonderful. <laughs> and as it stands her in, and it stands her in good stead right now, because we don't expect to end this event until around 11.30 tonight. That's in Groningen, not uh, in New York. Insomniac revels apart, and Sophie Lehmann is one of our most inventive and versatile historians of both art and material culture. She's been professor of art history and material culture at the University of Groningen since 2015, prior to which she taught at the University of Utrecht, where she had completed her PhD. And Sophie has published on a wide range of topics, often focusing on the importance and significance of materials in artworks and artifacts. She addresses craft, for instance, in her article, Showing Making on Visual Docu Documentation and Creative Practice in the Journal of Modern Craft in 2012. She's edited and co-edited edited a number of volumes, among which I would single out Hiding, Making, Showing Creation, the studio from Turner to Tacita Dean from 2013. Now, but my favorite article, uh, not that I've read them all, is on Jan von Eyck's depiction of hairs on the bodies of Adam and Eve in the Ghent altarpiece. Anne Sophie is also a practiced exhibition organizer, notable instances being object lessons, material begreifen in acht lektionen at the Museum der Dinge, uh, Museum of Things in Berlin, and the Gewerbe Museum Winterthur uh, in 2016 17, and also Goed gemaakt at the Kunsthal. Kada in Amersfoort in 2017. She's received various grants and fellowships, the last of which was at the uh, Internationale Kolleg für Kultur, Technik, Forschung und Medienphilosophie in Weimar. Now, I think anyone deserves a fellowship just for saying that. And Sophie <laughs> could say it so much more elegant and effortlessly than me, not least because she's not Dutch, but German. In my opinion, her greatest accomplishment is that she speaks Dutch fluently and beautifully. That's extremely rare for a German or indeed for any non-native Dutch speaker. So it's with that thought that I move on to saying a few words on how this evening's event will run. Professor Lehmann will speak for about 40 minutes and then we will open things up for questions and discussion. For the question and answer session, please use the Q&A function. We have a number of colleagues and students joining us as panelists. And for the panelists, please use the raise hand function and I'll call on you to unmute and ask your question. We have automatic captioning, which you can turn on using the CC option at the bottom of your screen. We're recording this event and a copy of the video will be available on our website and YouTube channel afterwards. And now I want to turn things over to Anne-Sophie Lehmann, who will speak to us on object biography, the life of a concept. 
Over to you, Anne Sophie. Thank you, Ivan, so much for that beautiful introduction. I'm now tempted to speak in Dutch, but <laughs> I won't. And um, I will commence here with my first slide. Object biography, the life of a concept. Things that talk, Lorraine Daston observed in the introduction to her influential 2004 edited volume of the same title, need people as ventriloquists. Also concepts are things, discursive objects produced by an author or a school of thought, and if useful to think with, can exist for a long period of time and space over which they are applied, probed, changed, expanded upon, but usually remain consistent at the core. A concept therefore could be expected to be quite a talkative thing. But what would it talk about when asked about its life? During the first part of my talk, I will play ventriloquist and read to you from a recent conversation I had with a concept of object biography. The second part of my talk answers to the request that ensued from that conversation, namely to research the life of the concept. So from now on, it's the concept talking. Yes, hi there, hello, I'm the object biography. Thanks for inviting me. I wish I could be there in person. Just kidding, even without Zoom, I am always virtual. But I know it's difficult to have a conversation with a concept, no body, no face. So why don't you take this nice allegorical figure as a stand in for the time being? An artist who made things talk in the 70th century designed her, and maybe you can come back to her later. Just imagine her for now as my ventriloquist. So, what would you like to know? What makes me so attractive? Well, of course, I'm quite flattered by the popularity I have gained over the past decennia, and in so many fields material, culture studies, craft and design studies, art history, anthropology, archaeology, history, conservation and restoration, museum studies. There are probably more. They don't all tell me when they use me. This might sound a bit conceited, but I'm not surprised because I am really quite inspiring and useful because I create attention for the trajectories of objects and how these change over time. I also connect different approaches to objects, which have been dealt with by separate subdisciplines. For instance, research into making, into provenance, exhibition history, conservation, restoration and reconstruction, perception and reception, social and economical histories of things. Well, normally people researching these aspects do not necessarily connect, but I bring them and the stuff they do together. Here, you can see, I made a drawing of it. The arrows, the vertical ones, indicate the diverse and often separate approaches to objects. And the horizontal line, that's the biography. And here, you see how I connect them by making them all part of the biography of an object. What, what are you saying? You're surprised concepts can draw? Of course I draw, I draw things together. Lots of concepts that are successful in the humanities claim to encourage interdisciplinarity. Like for instance, agency or affordances, networks. But I think I'm even more interdisciplinary because I don't have so much theoretical baggage. I am basically self-explanatory. You don't need to mention a name or explain theory to understand me. And I'm so much older than those other concepts. Did you know I go back more than 200 years now? Yeah, actually, most people think I was born in 1986. So funny how human scholars assume anything of theoretical relevance must have been thought up during their own lifespans. But it was more of a rebirth after a long midlife crisis, man. No one paid attention to things because of this uh, linguistic turn, 
now that concept is quite dead. And then, ta-da, here I made a comeback. What a great year, 1986. I owe my revival to an anthropologist, an expert in African culture and slavery, born in China with a Russian name, educated in French and English schools, moved to Chile when he was 18, went to Africa, and finally settled to study in the US. Experienced in the mobility of subjects and objects, and not drawing the lines so tightly between them, he presented me as a key player to the emerging field of material culture studies in this book, The Social Life of Things. This chapter gets inevitably referenced when people mention me. Did you know it has been cited over 10,000 times and reprinted in 10 anthologies? But the more successful a concept is, the more critique it has to endure. I'm always under siege because people want to rethink or expand upon me. And though they all seem to want the same for objects, acknowledgement of their diverse material histories, they disagree about if I am the way to get there. Some have proposed to, altern alternate, to alternate me with the so-called life cycle model, arguing that biography is traditionally reserved for unique or famous objects and tends to focus on special events in a life. While a life cycle model lists all events in an object's existence, no matter how mundane. I would counter that the notion of biography has evolved since the days it was reserved for famous white men and now follows the dictum, nothing should be omitted or concealed. And that rather than setting up an accompanying model, one need not even conceptually expand upon me in order to let me include all object life events. Others argue that objects should not be approached through the notion of biography at all, because biography, life writing, is such an anthropocentric term. Objects, after all, are not born, and they don't die, and they don't talk, and all that. Well, from an anthropocentric viewpoint, you might indeed say that biography is anthropocentric. But who says that life belongs only to humans? We might trace a theoretical genealogy from Adorno, Heidegger, and Hannah Arendt to Bruno Latour, Jane Bennett, and other new materials thinkers who argue otherwise. Not in order to even out differences between humans and non-humans, but as Bill Brown paraphrasing Adorno, because, and I quote, accepting the otherness of things is the condition for accepting otherness as such, end of quote. Sorry, what are you saying? Too convoluted for the audience? Oh, of course, I'm sorry. I got carried away there, concept talk. So what I mean is that I, the object biography, am a metaphor and not a metaphor. And that is precisely what makes me so catchy. And the very idea for objects to have a life has allowed me, as a concept, to exist beyond a human lifespan. It would help, by the way, if those who think that biography became prominent only with the rise of biology, and that this reflects the 19th century shift that installed the natural sciences as ruling research paradigm against the humanities, would get their history straight. In truth, the term biography was already introduced in the late 17th century and framed a genre of history writing that had been around since antiquity. And this is only one part of the story, because the notion of life was never owned by one discipline. It is obviously just as biological as it is religious, and diverse religions imbue objects with life. As a concept, object biography is really the perfect example for what Bruno Latour calls, borrowing the idea from Michel Serre, quasi-object, that means a thing between Oh, I'm sorry, concept talk yet again. In a nutshell, what I'm trying to say is that I am also political. Yes, quite right, I'm a religious Marxist. That is a paradox, you think? Sure, 
but it is less paradoxical than it appears if you look into my history, and the apparent contradiction also accounts for my appeal. One might say objects have a life because people live with them. This is how this other material culture, philosopher, and cultural history scholar describes it. I'm blanking on his name right now, I'm sorry, but I believe he works over there with you. He wrote an article about the life of things in 2015. Wait, I have a quote from it right here. Those who would see into the life of things cannot confine themselves to the taxonomic domains of biology, for there is life in senses numinous or sacred well beyond their confines. But those who are less inclusive in order to sidestep the issue of life suggested a different name for me altogether. Object, object itinerary. Sorry, Ooh, it always makes me yawn, that word, itinerary. And though this designation comes with a thick and theoretically advanced padding, it has not caught on as far as I know. You know why? Because its implication of plant movement is just a tad boring. Life, on the other hand, is not. For one, because death can be right in the middle of it. Life implies death, and death is always an important event in biographies. Strangely enough, death is the reason that I have been under attack from another direction very recently. An English archeologist and curator, very active in the decolonizing of collections, blames me for being complicit in co covering up the histories of colonial objects. In a 2020 article titled Necrography, he writes, the idea of the cultural biography of objects has, stif has served to stifle any discussion of enduring colonial violence and dispossession over time. What is silence then in our model of life histories are histories of loss and death, end of quote. Now this accusation puzzles me because the scholar who revived me in 1986 departed exactly from such violence and histories of dispossession, not only of objects, but of people as objects, of slaves. Now, why, I wonder, should I be reduced to a necrography if object biography includes death? And why should an object that has been forced to live a bad life, that has been abducted, misused, annihilated, not get its biography back? In what I have seen from my numerous applications to objects, that is exactly what I have been achieving to make visible what has been forgotten about objects. Or to quote the 1986 chapter, biographies of things can make salient what might otherwise remain obscure. Life cycle, itinerary, necrography, I'm willing to engage with but I do not want to give up my name for them. Because would it not be ironic if those invested in uncovering the lost histories of objects would, by renaming me, cover up my history as a concept? The Marxist and religious roots I alluded to earlier are fundamental to the things I do for objects and would be lost in relabeling. So I make a plea here to write my history the biography of a concept. Now, before you start, there is one last thing you have to know that I believe makes me uh, important. I appeal to many audiences, scholars, scientists, museum visitors, but also young people, children even. And that is quite unusual in the life of concepts, I can tell you. I do suspect that it is the real reason that some academics want to rename me. They just think me childish, feel they have to stoop down to deal with me, that I'm too educational, pedagogical. And you know what? I am. That is probably 
Well, I'm so tired these days, worn out by the continuous didactic efforts to teach people that things are so much more than consumable commodities, that humans must educate themselves about object lives in order to learn how to use things as long as possible and make sure the materials were harvested, produced, transported in a sustainable fashion and repair, reuse and recycle things in order to prolong object life. It is quite a job. But like I said in the beginning, I think it makes me quite useful. And so the concept, despite being slightly overworked, might babble on. You have probably guessed the names of the scholars it alluded to in its self-centered account. Igor Kopitov, Aryuna Padurai, Kirsten Daniel, Ivan Gaskell, Hans Peter Hahn, and Dan Hicks. These are only a few of the thinkers who have engaged with it, and some would might to talk back. But for now, let's look at some of the claims the concept has made about its present relevance. There can be no question that the concept is popular and widespread. The commented bibliography I have been working on with master students now contains over 50 titles discussing or applying the object biography in various academic fields and describing its mobilization in museums for educational settings for restoration and technical analysis. In the object biography literature, interdisciplinary is explicitly mentioned as a benefit, as you can see in these examples. A rough division into themes furthermore shows that object biographical approaches are used to tackle conceptual thinking about objects. We have heard the concept speak about that. To address object values and issues of conversation and restoration, and more recently to understand cognitive aspects of human object relations and to explore new forms of writing. As a didactic tool, the object biography is used in education and employed to raise awareness for sustainability and recycling. It is also explored for creative writing purposes. In fact, it appears that writing with and for objects creates a potentially richer and more imaginative style, as well as diversified and more precise material vocabulary. As early as 1983, in a review essay on the use of artifacts for social history writing, Mary Johnson points to the enlivening effect that things have on dry academic writing and that they produce a more animated style. And many have since confirmed this effect. As a consequence of its evident usefulness, recent handbooks like the Oxford Handbook of History and Material Culture Studies, published in 2020 and edited uh, by, by Ivan Gaskell, do not discuss the object biography anymore, but simply include it as established approach. The archeologist John, John Robb, for instance, in the chapter Material Time, introduces the object biography as one of the ways of conceptualizing the sequence of operations involved in making and using a thing. Rob's definition of biography is not anthropocentric, rather it is a tape measure for how humans exist in time materially. And I quote here, the temporality of humans as material objects is their biography, an elastic story with a tough core extending from conception and birth through growth and maturation, reproduction, degeneration, death, and frequently transformation into post-mortal social beings. Through this simple switch in categories, Rob shifts the anthropocentric focus of biography and opens it to all material objects. It can be concluded that the concept really is widely used inside and beyond universities, museums and schools for research, education and outreach. With the people of Bart Graduate Center right in the middle of it. Here with the example 
of the 47 one more thing one minute talks initiated during lockdown in 2021 and i enjoyed them a lot it can also be concluded that the concept has proven to afford interdisciplinary object studies and has moved beyond the critique of being essentially anthropocentric so far no surprises but the concept also spoke of its historical origins and its roots in Marxist as well as religious thinking, two domains or paradigms that could not appear more disparate, but in their combination are crucial for the concept's longevity. In order to verify that claim, the remainder of my talk highlights some events in the life of the object biography as a concept, and it does so by moving backwards in time. Already prior to the famous 1986 launch of the object biography by Igor Kopitov, the concept was imminent in the emerging field of material culture studies. Edward McClung Fleming's 1974 article for the Winter Tour portfolio, Artifact Study, a proposed model, starts with a quote by Ruskin on how cultures write their history by way of autobiographical accounts of their deeds, words, and art. Further down, McClum Fleming draws on George Kubler, who argued for an intersection between the artist's biography and the study of objects. Fleming's model, tested on an American cupboard I'm showing you here, is rather cut and dry, but the object biography is lingering between the lines. Henry Hawley's 1978 paper about a French chandelier likewise toys with the idea in the first sentence, when he writes, like human beings, works of art have life histories. Both rely on a well-established art historical concept, the Nachleben or Fortuna Critica, of a particular work of art and expand it to include making materials, use, and some socio-historical contexts. These approaches do not strain far from trodden paths, and I'm sure there are more examples, but they leave lots of what could be discovered about objects in the dark. The distinct political charging of objects as shapers of human life undertaken by Kopitov in his The Cultural Biography of Things, Commoditization as Process, therefore draws on a different lineage and can be traced back to earlier Marxist texts on objects. Unknown to Kopitov, but incidentally referenced in later object biography literature, is the short essay, The Biography of Objects, by the Russian novelist and playwright Sergei Trechikov. Published in 1929, the text was translated into German in the GDR in 1985 and into English in 2006. Trechikov criticizes the hero-centered narrative of the novel and calls for a focus on the things that humans make in order to shift focus to human engagement with the material world in all its dimensions. He imagined such a biography as moving along production lines, drawing the humans that the object encounters in its making into the story. And I quote, the compositional structure of the biography of the object is a conveyor belt along which a unit of raw material is moved and transformed into a useful product through human effort. The biography of the object makes the private public, Trechikov writes as, and I quote, emotion finds its proper place and is not felt as a private experience. And in the biography of the object, we can view class struggle synoptically at all stages of the production process. To anyone, 
familiar with G. Gavertov's Men with a Movie Camera, shot and montaged in the same year, Tretyakov's words are visualized here almost one to one. His essay concludes with a call to action. On the object's conveyor belt, the revolution is heard as a mass phenomenon, for the masses necessarily share in the biography of the object. Thus, not the individual person moving through a system of objects, but the object proceeding through the system of people. For literature, this is the methodological device. Tretchkov ends with a call to writers to write books such as The Forest, Bread, Coal, Iron, Flax, Cotton, Paper, The Locomotive, and The Factory, which have not yet been written. We need them, and it is not, it is only through the biography of objects that they can be adequately realized, he writes. And I have highlighted the locomotive and flax because they are shown here in Vert of Stills and flax in particular, because it will return further on in my talk. So here, the object biography is launched as a methodological literary device as its narrative weaves together what capitalism destroys, the human knowledge and ownership of production means and processes. Six years earlier, George Lukács had explained the Marxist model of the reification of objects in his essay, Das Phänomen der Verdinglichung, published in 1923, writing that reification covered up the, I quote, qualitative material immediate character of things, destroying their, and I quote again, original and true thingness, end of quote. Thus buried underneath industrial capitalist modes of production, there lay a life of things in which objects coexisted with those who had made them. In 1958, Hannah Arendt would return this notion in her short art theory embedded in the chapter on work, Herstellung, of the human condition, where she presented Homo Faber as maker of thought things, objects that allow to reflect on a sustainable relation with the environment that offers the raw materials needed for world making. Compared to the playful suggestion of artifact life by authors like Fleming and Hawley, now the object biography radically changes from attention for a special individual, the chest or the chandelier, to generalized members of the working class. Tretyakov's calls for object biographies also implies multiple authors in order to ensure different perspectives and experiences. The political genealogy of the object biography can be traced back further in time, leading not too far away from Marx's doorsteps to the enterprise of education as it unfolded in London. Here, in the 1870s, the biographies that Tretyakov called for in 1929 were already being written. Their author was Annie Carey, who published in 1871, the autobiographies of a lump of coal, a grain of salt, a drop of water, a bit of old iron, a piece of flint, and a year later, a book called Threads of Knowledge, drawn from a cambric handkerchief, a Brussels carpet, a print dress, a kid glove, and a sheet of paper. A third book, now on the history of the book, that features four books book of different formats chatting in the back of a bookstore was published in 1877. Carey was one of the many women active <clears throat> in the creative industry of London, mid 19th century, whose biographies are only just now being recovered. She attended the London Female School of Art 
and became a writer of educational children's fiction for the large publishing house Cassell, Petter and Gorkin. In the autobiographies, the reader meets a group of children, girls and boys, who are engaging in an everyday action, like lightning a fire, and you can see that here in the illustration, eating, drinking, <clears throat> when all of a sudden, the things that partake in the process, like coal or salt or water, catch their interest and then start to talk to them. They tell the children about their material transformations and uses, unveiling all kinds of technical, scientific and cultural knowledge and ultimately imbuing the listeners with material literacy and a sense of awe for their environment. The stories are well written and still capture the imagination through the enticing blend of science and fairy tale. And I'm showing you here um, threads of, of knowledge. If one filters out the style, the metaphors and way of thinking are not so far removed from contemporary new materialist writings. The preface to threads of knowledge ends with the quote I'm showing you here, um, showcasing the threads as paths that people can move along together in order to learn in a pleasant and enlightening fashion. Conceptually speaking, the shift from the political to the educational object biography that occurred between Chechakov and Carey mostly concerns the audiences. The objects remained the same namely everyday things and materials that concern society at large. Trechikov desired a biography of coal and Carey wrote it. The educational format of Carey's stories can be traced back to 18th century educational writings by evangelist dissenters like Anna Barbeau on the one hand and to the format of object lesson teaching in the tradition of Pestalozzi and Froebel on the other. Such formats are deeply rooted in the religious and democratic ambition to teach everyone about everything through the hands-on engagement with the environment. Religious dissenters, Protestants such as Jan Amos Comenius, developed them in the first half of the 17th century and they spread and were employed all over Europe. It is here we will see where the affiliation between religious and Marxist thinking that constitutes the core of the object biography lies. You will have noticed that Carey's biographies use a particular narrative device, the autobiography, giving a voice to the things themselves. As a literary genre, recent scholarship has studied the phenomenon of the talking object as a British genre, the so-called it narrative, that emerged in the 18th century with publications such as The Adventures of a Choir of Paper. The narrative format, however, also thrived in other European countries. And where most of its writers are little known, a Danish author acquired world fame. Hans Christian Andersen wrote several short fairy tales that follow the genre conventions of the object biographies, two of which I would like to highlight. The first one is the tale of the teapot, published in 1863. A beautiful porcelain teapot is proud of the handle and spout, though she has a crack in the lid. And she talks about holding tea leaves and serving thirsty humans. One day she's dropped and breaks her crucial pouring devices spout and handle. But she's given away to a woman who fills her with soil and plants a flowering bulb in her. This new humbler purpose makes the teapot extremely happy. As the plant grows, the teapot eventually breaks in two and is thrown away. But as she lies there, she cherishes her memories. This is obviously a fairy tale with issues. 
and a critical interpretation would quickly point out its conflation of moralizing, gendering features and their disnification in other fairy tale sporting animated objects. But there is also an element in this tale which relates to today's urgency of reusing and recycling not only as an economic boon, but as an ethical obligation and even a thing of joy as web for us sharing photos of cracked teapots with plants on the line. Another Anderson fair tale, the flax, moves from the individual thing to a general material as it tells the story of the plant. I'm showing you here an edition illustrated and published in the Netherlands in 1942 by the style designer Bart van der Leck. Flax enjoys its life as a plant with its beautiful blue flowers and describes the excruciating pain of being cut, beaten, spun and woven. And then its sudden pleasure at discovering its new usefulness as textile. I'm showing you here a couple of pages where this the story is um, described. But there are new sorrows. The linen is eventually cut and worn. And after being torn and too dirty, after being worn for a long time, it is thrown away. But there is new wonder for flax at being recycled and discovering in its second life as paper to be even more useful and now delivering the ground for passing on knowledge a thing so grand that it had never dared dream of it when it was still a small blue flower in the field. And you can see this sequence nicely captured on the left by von der Leck, um, who features the writer and the, the large blue square to reference the, the blue flowers of the flax. At the end, when the paper has served its purpose and is used to start a fire, the spirit of the flax vanishes in the flames, expressing its contentedness at having been in the world. The tale of the flax is another object biography that Trechikov would explicitly call for 70 years after it had already been written. The industrial charms of the tale might have played a role for Bart von der Leck in selecting it for a standalone publication that bears signs of a constructivist aesthetics. It is, of course, not the critical biography Trechikov imagined, and Anderson does not touch upon the terrible circumstances of the linen workers in the 19th century. But the multiple transformations of the flax in which actual material actions are used to express emotions, experiences and reflections on knowledge making might not only have made the processes comprehensible and interesting to its readers, but also raised awareness for the circumstances of those who worked in the flax industry. I'm showing you a flax fiber from an educational box I will say more about tomorrow during the lunch lecture here. The tale certainly triggered the material senses of its listeners, promoted material literacy, knowledge about origins, value and use of plants, of techniques, manufacture and making. And like the teapot tale, it sent a clear message of reusing and recycling as economic, environmental and ethical obligation. While the spirit of the flax that tells the story expresses a religious or ritual aspect apparent in animation just as much as in the ethical charging of materials. Flax, in the words of Annie Carey, offers a thread of knowledge to pull and is fashioned by Anderson literally into a moral fiber. Can you remember that the concept of the object biography was rather tired at the end of its monologue you had to endure at the beginning of this talk. Its work in sustainability education 
has been going on for more than 200 years. No wonder it's exhausted. Having discussed some highlights in the long life of the object biography, I can already disclose that, unlike other concepts, the object biography has no distinct birth date or ground. Possibly, it goes back to inscriptions on artifacts that declare their use and makers, to histories of relics even. But the last example from the incomplete history I present here that could arguably be viewed as more than an application or the suggestion of an object biography and presents a fleshed out and is a fleshed out concept is what you have been looking at here in lieu of a picture of the concept itself. This is the detail of a sketch made by the Dutch engraver and publisher Jan Lauken. A design for the frontispiece of his book had Leersam Hausrat, um, the smart household stuff, which was published in Amsterdam in 1711. In 1711. The book appeals to the reader through a selection of 50 objects they would encounter in their everyday city-based upper to middle class life. The objects include furniture, household things to clean and cook, tools to make things with like the spinning wheel, textiles, perishable and ephemeral things like sugar and candles, but also things more readily charged with meaning like the mirror, a painting and a clock. Each thing is illustrated in use with the people who use it around it. And here in keeping with the theme on the right, you see the object number 46, a teapot. Each picture is accompanied with a moralizing text. The teapot, for instance, here takes on the theme of gluttony, warning the reader of uncontrolled consumption and adding several Bible references. This, however, does not imply that drinking tea and coffee or using a teapot is as such immoral. Rather, the book was to be used, most likely by reading it in a social setting to one another, to inspire awareness for everyday things and use them to think things through. In the preface, Jan Lauken introduces the readers who had been taught to read the Bible and the Book of Nature, aka the natural environment, to a third book, the Book of Things, he calls it, aka the made world, in order not to be blind to the everyday objects in their surroundings, but actually use them to reflect. A few years earlier, Lauken had published a book of traits modeled on Hans Sachs and Joost Amann's Ständebuch and expanding it with new occupations. Also here, the illustrations of making are coupled with moralizing verse. And you see here on the left, um, the napkin, an example from the, the smart household things, and on the right, the dressmaker. So on the left-hand people using textiles and on the right-hand people making textiles. Taken together and looked at from the perspective of the concept of the object biography, things talk here about their relation with people who make and use them. Laugen's design for the frontispiece introduces an allegorical figure that makes things talk, pointing to each object in the great book of things telling their stories. Contemporary criticism of commodification, overconsumption, and hypercapitalism might find her a suitable ancestor. And to those who think about the concept of the object biography, she might be a convincing personification. I was going to thank you at this point, but the concept just texted me to let me know that there is actually so much more to its conceptual life. And if I would consider its story a bit more, yes, well, I will next time, I promise. But for now, thank you for listening.
Thank you so much, Anne Sophie. One word, schitterend. <laughs> it's just as well that you gave the talk in English, I think, for our listeners that, uh, rather than Dutch. But I think uh, it's a Dutch word that means wonderful that came to my mind. Um, while, while with an eye made quiet by the power of harmony and the deep power of joy, we see into the life of things. So with William Wordsworth's words, I'd like to call on our panelists to uh, uncover themselves and spring to life and begin this, the process of questions. Uh, panelists, questions for Anne Sophie. Here are Aaron, please go ahead. Thank you, thank you so much. That was a, it was a wonderful talk and I, I love the reverse trajectory of it. Um, as it happened, it was also an amazingly timed talk um, as Marion who's here in the room will know because just yesterday, um, I, I'm teaching a class this semester called The Social Lives of Things. And just yesterday we read the social life of things. And we had the benefit of our new colleague, um, Arjuna Potterai, zooming in from Berlin to talk us through the uh, inception and legacy of that book. So I, Ivan couldn't have curated the timing of your talk uh, more perfectly uh, without knowing that. Um, one of the things that one of the things that Arjun told us, um, and I checked to see if he was on the chat because I was just gonna if he, if he was in the room, I was gonna just invite him to do this himself. Um, was that um, uh, not only were were they thinking about Marx at the time and talking about Marx and the commodity, rethinking the commodity, but that the other main um, interlocutor uh, for them uh, historically was uh, Marcel Mauss. And, Mars, and Moses' work on the gift, and in, and in thinking through the gift commodity distinction, and in you know a lot of work at the time, and sort of rethinking it and challenging it, and um, I think one of the one of the things that that Moses' interest in the gift and his own filtering of anthropological and ethnographic materials about the gift, um, and the kind of that sort of radical European fantasy of the gift as being an alternative to the commodity in certain ways um, is that the gift puts people into relationship with one another um, and uh, rather than um, enforcing the alienating effects of com commodities under capitalism. And so I was thinking about I was thinking about I was thinking with most about relation relationality and how how the concept of biography, has the potential to privilege the boundedness of the object, even while using a kind of uh, anthropomorphic analogy of a life, right? Um, so thinking about the life of the object, but it's still the object. And so I'm, th I'm thinking about the potential. And one of the things I like about the concept of, of biography or life of object, thinking relationally, is um, to think about the, the other lives outside of the object that the life is that the life of the object is in relation to. And so for me, you know, thinking, thinking, say, with with the Maori concept of whakapapa, which is a kind of um, expanded, uh, a kind of expanded version of the notion of genealogy, that people have genealogies that link them in time to other people, to other lives. But the treasured things of families are also in genealogical kinship relationships with people. And so I'm wondering if in your deep dive in the history of the concept of ob object biography, um, did any of the authors sort of, um, you know, you talked a little bit about the ways, the moralizing tales and the ways in which people talked, uh, you maybe especially the Russians about the lives of the makers of things. But other, other people who put the life of the discrete bounded object, which has its own course, 
into sort of a broader relations with the humans and maybe other than humans beings whose lives those objects are deeply entangled with. Um, so it, in a way, it's, it's how much can we push the biography of the thing into a sort of model of kinship that is, you know, biographies of individuals uh, in relationship to other individuals um, in a kind of sort of expansive yeah. temporal social network. Anyway, that, that's, that's my question. Thank you very much, and and how wonderful to hear that you just that you just read um, read the texts, um, because I found that um, well, how you know how it often happens that that the, the copy of text is when you reread is so, so much richer than than how the object biography has often been um, treated in in its reception as a concept. Um, to, to your question. Um, Trechikov's text, which is a really short text, um, it's really, it's not even an essay, it's something he probably jotted down, but, but this, um, this metaphor, of, uh, it's, it's, of course, it's very industrial, and that's why it doesn't seem so, uh, so compatible with maybe Moss's thinking, but this metaphor of the conveyor belt, uh, where the object is slow, is produced, and then he really imagines, it's really visual the people coming in uh, that are drawn by the object into um, a collaborative process really flips this idea of of the biography not being within the boundaries of the thing but in the production and then this is not what he mentions but it's it, it would be logical the use and the reuse um, so that is really an, an entanglement and um, what I think is that the conceptual shift there is interesting. And I, I should have highlighted that maybe better, but um, so, so the object biography as it has been used by, by art historians before in the 70s, uh, who I cited, that's about the individual thing that's already in the museum. And, and then this Marxist tradition opens it up to the general, object and not even the object the materials like flax is that's um it's not about it could be about that individual flax flower um but, but it's about flax in general and that always sort of draws in a lot of people um because the material is is fluid and open and congeals into things but also is, is being reused and and opened up again so in a way, um, I would say it's, it could be said it's implicit in this idea of the, the as least as Trechikov and 19 authors treat it. Does that answer your question? Thank you, Anne-Sophie. I see that Andrew has his virtual hand virtually raised. Andrew, please go ahead and unmute. Uh, yes, thank you very much for such a stimulating talk. Um, it, it's interesting that uh, I'm currently teaching a course uh, to the first year students on approaches, which we introduce with different speakers um, each week, a different approach to the object. And one of the um, exercises um, my colleague Freya Hartzler and I have given the students is precisely uh, an object from our study collection that they don't know, and we ask them to write an object memoir. And um, the results of that have been the first time I've taught it, and it's been very, very revealing, precisely um, because it has, in voicing the life of the object itself, the students have raised precisely these issues of labor history, you know, of, um, of the trajectory through time and different usage and so forth, in really very interesting ways. Um, just as you describe, it's wonderful. Um, my question really is, is, is as a historian, um, the usefulness of this auto, autobiographical approach, um, which I see through exercises like this is essentially um, to ask questions or to raise questions through you know, the material exploration of an object and to, and to ask questions by even fictionally about them. Do you see this as a viable form of 
historical writing per se, the autobiography, the voice of the object as it were. Thank you. Um, so um, I, I did the same thing last year with, with students and, and the assignment was to, um, to take an object from the Reichsbeam collection. We were still uh, in, in lockdown then. And they wrote a short autobiographical essay. And the fun of course was to assume the, the, the voice of the object. And it was wonderful that there were amazing stories. And I was struck by particular one thing, and that was that there was a lot of pain going on. And the pain came from the objects being made. Because if you have, if you have no information, it, um, the selection of the objects was had one restriction. There had to be no information. So these had to be objects they nobody knew anything about. So that's why the students turn to making because that's something you can gather from any object you can you see the material and you can imagine how it was produced and so these objects experience pain um, because they're carved and cut and acid is used and heat and um and that made gruesome wonderful tales of course but afterwards i also wondered hey but doesn't that tell us something about um, the bodily experience of makers possibly in, in creating something. Um, and we always have these notions that making is something beautiful and, and romantic, and, and, um, but it's also, it, it's tough and hard and you might get injured and um, it's unhealthy. And at that point, I was for the first time thinking, this is more than just trying to to creep inside the object and just assume, um, train more imaginative forms of writing. There was something happening really. So of course it's always a, a style and a trick, but, but at the same time, I think the switch of thinking. So if historians, if you just train this once, it, it does something to the way of how you think about things. So I would say, yes, it's, it's valid. Well, I completely agree with you I, as, a, as, a, as a technique towards understand, to historical understanding. Um, but then there's the next stage of writing the history, it seems to me. <laughs> Not in the voice of the object, or perhaps, yeah. uh, perhaps you disagree, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, we have three students in well, one of my uh, seminars this semester who've already met uh, and Sophie uh, in uh, class this morning virtually. Uh, so while uh, I, rather than putting them all on the spot suddenly, uh, I'm going to turn to the Q and A where there are a couple of questions. Uh, but I'd I'd love it if uh, if you, uh, um, the Marion and Pim and Julia, if you have questions uh, for and Sophie Lehman when we've. Uh, looked at questions in the Q&A. Here's a question from Josh Massey. Uh, during your talk, you mentioned a number of creative and critical interventions into the life of things from the likes of Annie Carey, Tretyakov and Hans Christian Andersen. You also mentioned the potential of the object biography to bring a richness of style and more imaginative thought to the work of academics in material culture studies art history, and other object-centered fields. I'd like to know your thoughts about creative production as a part of, and perhaps a necessity, of creative material culture work. Thank you. Yeah, that ties back to what Andrew Morell also um, asked, I think. And um, yes. Um, it's it's definitely. I mean, we've already had examples now of 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 people engaged in in teaching about material culture who who use this um, this technique. Um, but rather than now imagining all kinds of books or articles being written from the perspective of the object, um, I would what what is really happening, I think, is when you when you scrutinize contemporary writings. Um, 
about objects and materials of people who have tried to get as close as possible that their vocabulary changes and becomes more precise and more imaginative. So it's something that it really asks for a different style if you engage with objects. And that's something that also Ivan, um, you have in, in another edited volume on, um, I think it was the university collection in Harvard that you, that you wrote about, where, where you write in the introduction about how things draw a different way of writing. Um, if you say critical material culture work, I, I hope I um, made that clear at the end of my talk that I see a direct relation between those um, early 19th century fairy tales about, about the environment and contemporary um, raising of awareness for for production, a uh, means of production and where things are produced and sustainability. And that's not new, of course. I mean, we know that um, environmentalism is, has historical roots, um, but, but this particular kind of writing, I'm sure has, has a lot to, can actually help as the concept said when it spoke in creating that awareness. Great, I wonder if I can, open this a little further and think in terms of what the what you've been uh, suggesting might mean for curatorial scholarship for work in museums uh, is it possible to uh, to think of these methods in the context of museums of of any and every kind I think we should just try. Mm -hmm. I mean, and what, what it what it always provokes is that you you face um, how little you know about a given object, and by by switching the perspective, um, become so much more um, humbled. Actually, that's what I experienced in the students who were awed by having to speak from the perspective of the object simply by discovering the richness of a thing, yeah. even in its very, very smallness. Right. I've experienced this in a museum uh, where students had, uh, was, were uh, putting into, uh, into practice what they had been working on during the course of a semester uh, at the Rhode Island School of Design. So this was in the Rhode Island School of Design Museum, the RISD Museum, where uh, as, a, as a visitor, I was going from case to case and beside uh, a number of vitrines, there were uh, students waiting for victims like me. And then they introduced themselves as objects in the vitrines and then told their stories. So it was really quite interesting to have to stand there and hear a uh, a, a rather large person uh, beside a rather small silver coffee pot uh, speaking in the persona of the coffee pot. Uh, it was slightly, I won't say alarming, but disconcerting uh, in a good way. Uh, and that's the kind of project that might uh, be feasible for, uh, in a, for curatorial presentation. It's just one, one idea. Uh, that has been put into practice at RISD. But I have here a question from Deborah Crone in the Q&A. Hello, Anne-Sophie, thanks for your talk. I wonder if you've come across a fascinating text from the early 16th century, Corozet's Blason Domestique, which goes through many rooms and pieces of furniture describing each object's function and purpose. This might be a very early example of an object biography. I've written about the text in a couple of forthcoming articles. So is this something Thank new? You. This is new to me. Thank you, Deborah. This is brilliant. And I'm, I'm looking forward to, to reading the articles and um, also compare it to, um, to the, the smart household of Jan Lauken. Yeah. Um, so 
it, it would be interesting to know. I mean, there, there are these very short items on objects like labels, you know, object who refer to, to I have been made by so and so. Um, or the, the, the book that you open and the book may, may talk to you, uh, dear reader, um, be careful when you read me because you might come across. Uh, so these, um, and I guess what I, what I like about Lauken is that he really, he really prompts the idea of this is the, a book of things that you can read in. So I offer to you the whole world of things to, to consider. Um, and I would just wonder historically if there is a if there is a difference between an inscription and the actual thinking conceptually about this the possibility of the thing. But I'm yeah, I'm, I'm I would very much like to read what you've written. So your mention of of Jan Lauken uh, intrigued me, and I'm just. This is just something I'm wondering. Uh, do you think that his uh, approach to objects and the household, uh, just uh, like his approach to, to crafts, uh, was in any way colored by his, what I understand from some vague distant memory, his rather peculiar religious views? Uh, did he not undergo a, a kind of a religious awakening in early adulthood, and then join a uh, a group that was perhaps somewhat, from the orthodox Calvinist point of view, somewhat eccentric. Thank you, Ivan. I uh, I have to I have to still research Jan Lauken in more depth in order to be able to connect that to his background. But as he he was also um, economically a smart man, and the book, um, just like the um, the book of occupations, to which is, it, it kind of mirrors um, a, a, as an idea. Um, it it appeared to me so far as a, as appealing to a large crowd. The the way it was um, designed and the reception it got. But thank you for the hint. I will um, and, portray that. And Andrew has raised his hand virtually, probably because he knows a great deal about Jan Lauken, but maybe maybe not. Let's see. That is well known. I don't want to ask another question when the others in line, but um, I just was terribly interested by, well, one thing I think is that the, the Jostar Mann Stendebuch on which it is based, uh, it isn't when you look at the, the pictures, but it's presented in the introduction as a history of almost of technology, the history of, of, of trades, the history of, 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 of invention um, by the, I think it's Sigmund Feyerab, the, the publisher, and um, who writes this very learned introduction to it. So it, there's a kind of link there, um, if, if only in the, in the introduction, which I, by, by the early 17th century, probably if you, you know, the Dutch, uh, editions would not have not have included. Um, but I, I had a, a question really about the this very interesting link between religion and Marxism that uh, that, that you drew attention to in the 18th century dissenting tradition um, of, of Protestantism. I, I'd, I'd love to hear just a little bit more about that um, because you know, ironically, one always thinks of the Protestant tradition as being dependent on the word. And uh, producing a kind of uh, a kind of religion that is based on interiority and personal prayer and so on, and, and um, not on objects, not on externals at all. So it's very interesting to me that um, this tradition comes out of a dissenting Protestant tradition. I, I'd love to hear a little bit more. That's. Um... That could potentially be a long answer. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> so um, it it goes no no no. Um, I so um, it, it's Comenius is 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 one of the first who develops this this teaching method um, with real life objects, and this is um, 
this is a way of teaching that should be available to anyone and for which you ideally would not even need books, although he publishes the books because he's, um, uh, he, 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 he thrives and survives on, on selling of his published books and publishes Latin primers. But the principle is that you can teach anyone anything um, by using the things in your immediate surroundings. And when you read Comenius, um, his earliest books for teaching young children, um, they read just like Montessori or um, the ref Dewey. I mean, this, this idea that through experience, um, picking up a stone and observing children, how they learn by pointing things out and touching things and tasting them. Um, it's a sort of, yeah, roots of, of a very immediate pedagogy, which is democratic because it's available to everyone, to, to the parents who should teach their, their kids like this and to the children themselves um, who can educate themselves. And this is then transformed into methods um, where, where Comenius uses images of which he says, actually, these are not images. These are so-called thing pictures. They really should not stand in for the things. Ideally, you use the things themselves. Um, but here you go with this book, you can, you know, you can do it yourself. Mm -hmm. And then um, this is, in, in England, the books are, are translated and, and you see this, this link with 18th century dissenting writers, um, uh, female writers uh, who develops this storytelling tradition um, of young kids who go out into the woods and see things and start picking up and describing them and educate themselves through this attention to, to nature. Mm. So it's a very straight line, in fact, um, from, yeah, from early 17th century Bohemia to all the way to Dewey, um, you could say. Thank you so much. Thanks, uh, Anne-Sophie. Uh, Marion Cox has raised her hand. Please, Marion. Hey, thank you so much, uh, Professor Lehman, for your talk. Um, so in Professor Gaskell's class, we read an essay by um, Professor David Morgan at Duke University a, a couple of weeks ago about enchantment. Um, and in that paper, he cites an anecdote um, from Bruno Latour where he he says, quote, I constantly talk with my computer who answers back. And he goes on. Um, and what I'm getting at is this, the role of our imagination um, in the biographies of things. I wonder what your thoughts are on that, especially because you, you did briefly touch on some some problems that people have with object biographies. Um, you talked about how they might be seen as scare quotes, immature um, or for children in some senses. And I think that maybe, maybe that trepidation comes from how easily we might overdo the enchantment factor um, or it's possible to easily overdo the enchantment factor. So I just wondered if you had any thoughts about how our imaginations are at play um, in object biographies. They, they most certainly are. Um, but I wanted to get at is that rather than um, then keep them safe outside, um, it's it's so much more interesting to to simply acknowledge that you know that 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 we have um, these ideas and and to allow them to be part of a story, always of course making very clear that that is an imagination and that that is gleaned from an object. Um, I'm not at all in favor of. Uh, of fantasy object biographies. I don't think it would be useful to anyone um, wanting to, to, to do historical research or writing to sort of think, oh, but then I can just imagine the whole thing. So um, 
you see what I mean? But but um, and, and Latour is one of the writers who, of course, is brilliant at allowing for the imagination to sort of seep in 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 his in his writings, but at the same time making very clear where where it comes from and how how it emerges. That's that's really interesting. Uh, I hope my faculty colleagues and friends will forgive me if I give precedence to the student panelists by asking uh, Pim Supervarasuat to ask her question. Thank you, Ivan. And thank you so much, Professor Lingman, for, for joining us today. And my question is actually related to Marian's and um, about the discussion that we were just having just now. So um, it has to do with the definiteness of, of these biographies. And um, I was just thinking that biographies for humans often have like authorized versions. And so my first question is that do you think an authorized version of an object biography is possible? And, and since I imagine that this is not always possible and it's not always the case, I, um, I would love to hear your thoughts about whether or not you think that these object biographies ended up being a reflection of the historian or the biographer more so than the objects um, themselves. Thank you. Um, can you repeat the last part of your question? Yeah, um, so the last part, I was wondering if you think um, sort of the biographies, object biographies that were written when um, maybe we know very little, like, like you just said, the imagination um, plays a big role in the writing of that. Do you think it then becomes a reflection of the the biographer or the historian, um, like your students who imagine the pain of being made into an object? Um, does that say more about that? Yeah. Yeah. Of course, I mean, in, in that sense, since we can never have the authorized object biography, um, in that sense, an object biography is rather, should serve to, to highlight exactly that, which is often hidden. If, if an historian writes a book about a certain object, um, then it comes, often comes across as the authorized version. And then the notion of the of of saying of calling it an object biography might help to actually you know make it clearer that this is not the authorized version that there could be many more authors that um, things of course might be found out in the future. I mean, this is very basic um, the very basic knowledge of. of that you have when you're a researcher, of course, but um, still it's it's like a self-reflective ethnographic tool. So, Anne-Sophie, it's the hour is getting late, uh, later where you are than where I am, but still, I wonder if you have the stamina for just two more questions. Is that okay? Sure. Right. Yeah. And let me uh, read a question. There are two questions in the chat that I'd like to read. I'll do them separately because I, for one, can only ever cope with one question at a time. This is from uh, our, uh, our con conservation uh, fellow, Soon Kai Po, with whom I'm teaching, the, with the two of us are teaching a, a course together this semester. Soon Kai writes, thanks so much for your thought provoking talk. My question is about the necessary critical distance between people and objects that is maintained by the notion of considering an object biography. I guess of the different fields you've described in the orbit of the object biography, conservation stroke restoration, at least as it is understood today, tends towards often making a direct physical intervention in the object. Does this close manner of interaction somehow collapse this distance in a way that changes how we might think of object biographies? Thank you for the question. It's it's interesting that in particular um, in conservation restoration and in particular in modern and contemporary art conservation. Um, the notion of the biography has been taken up 
in order to enable conservators and restorers to understand the object in full. So to consider all the, the stages it has went through um, from making to, to remaking. So um, I don't think it would. Um, I, I also don't think there would be that the, the critical distance that you would have conceptually would be the same as an actual physical distance so that you cannot be critical if you're physically close. Um, because I, I think ideally, if you do an, an, if you use an object biographical approach, you, you should also be able to handle the object to, to sound it, to smell it, I mean, to, to, to have a sensory grasp of it. Um, and a conservator might have to move um, a step further, but that wouldn't really change anything. And everybody who would later write about the object should know everything that a conserver or restorer did with it and mm. to it. It's mainly, it's a perspective that is, that is often thought of as a separate field. And, and that's why I had the concept made this drawing in the beginning where you can really see the, the potential of the object biography to use it so that they draw together all the people involved in, in shaping or covering this life story. Good, thank you. Um, and a final question from my faculty colleague, Jeffrey Collins. Thank you, Anne-Sophie, for such a stimulating and creative lecture. Since we've talked so much about object autobiography rather than third person biographies written by modern scholars, I wonder if you have examined the literary genre of the prosopopeia. I can think of, for instance, of several 18th century poems that use this device, such as talking statues, to tell their life story over long periods of time, and presumably such a use of the genre is far older. In the ones I'm thinking about, the objects are synecdoches for entire cities, peoples, or even civilizations, a clear sign that object biographies were understood as powerful rhetorical or heuristic devices long before the modern age. So the, 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 the device of, for instance, the talking statue, Thank you, um, Jeffrey Collins. Um, I would have to think about this because I suspect that as a rhetoric device, um, the talking statue does not talk about itself, but is then used to talk about, um, yes, like a civilization or, or a person. So, so it is rather turned around. So it is not used any... See, what, I, what I've tried to stick with is examples where it is really an object or a material process that is at the core of it and not like uh, the talking teapot in, in uh, Beauty and the Beast. These are also in the original 18th century, um, it's, it's late 17th century, even the original um, French fairy tale, are enchanted objects that become. Um, in fact, uh, a human being in the body of a teapot or uh, a chandelier and then act as a human being would be. So it's not, and, and that is, um, that's an interesting slippage there conceptually that I would have to carve out a bit more. I suspect that's what, um, what the prosopopoeia are about. Thanks so much, Anne-Sophie. So I think we should draw to a close here and, um, this has been a really fascinating uh, lecture and conversation that we've had. Thanks so much for dealing with, with such a lot of really fascinating questions. Uh, this, has, this has been a, a, a really, uh, I, feel, I feel as though I will look at Walt Disney's Fantasia and the uh, Sorcerer's Apprentice scene in, new, in a new way now as a result of your talk. So many thanks. Uh, 
we will hear you again, those of us internally, tomorrow at lunchtime when you'll be speaking to us again. Um, but uh, we will have further events that are open that will be streamed on November 9th at 12.15 uh, Eastern, Monica Miller, uh, and on November 10th at 12.15 Eastern, uh, Michelle Miller Fisher. So those are our next uh, events that are on the list, but please check out our website. Keep an eye on the many events that are happening both in person and online at Bard Graduate Center. Uh, we love engaging with all of you. So many thanks for joining us. And a final uh, reiteration of thanks to Anne-Sophie Lehmann. We'll let you get off uh, for a well-deserved nightcap. Thank you, Ivan, and thank you for having me and, and listening and the brilliant questions. They were very inspiring and will help me to develop this project further. Thank you. Yeah.